Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our Beginning Sheep and Goats workshop. Um, my name is Ruby Kutch-Feinberg. I'm the Agriculture and Food Systems Coordinator at Cornell Cooperative Extension, Putnam County. Um, and we also have Catherine coming to you from CCE Ulster today. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction about Cornell Cooperative Extension Putnam. Um, for those of you who are joining but are not totally familiar with our organization, um, we Cornell Cooperative Extension puts knowledge to work in pursuit of economic vitality, ecological sustainability, and social well-being. Our office um, probably has a different focus than Ulster's office, but our main areas of focus are agriculture and food systems, 4-H youth development, and then environmental horticulture and natural resources. Um, we're really excited to offer this winter farming workshop series, and this is our last class, so thank you all for joining. Um, during this session, once we get started, we're just asking folks to keep yourself on mute and feel free to put any questions you have in the chat um, during the presentation into the chat box just so we can um, answer them if it's relevant to that part of the presentation. Otherwise, we're just gonna answer them all at the end. Um, but I found it most helpful just to throw those chats into the, those questions into the chat as they come along. Um, I do have a brief program survey um, for folks to fill out. If you could just take one second pre-evaluation, that'll just help us figure out um, some information on the back end. That would be great. And I will wait for a few more replies. And also we're just putting into the chat, if you're just joining us today, things that you're interested in learning and where you're coming from, um, just so we can get an idea of, of all the folks that are here today. Let's see. So once Catherine um, takes over, I'll probably just go along and mute everybody. Um, Ruby, I think one thing we forgot. Did you make me a co-owner just in case you have any internet yes. issues? Okay. I think since you could share your screen, that means you're automatically, I already okay. set that up. You're all good. Wonderful. Cool. Hope that Zoom cooperates today, but you never know. <laughs> yes. Okay, Catherine, take right. it away. Awesome. So uh, thank you all for filling that out. It's it's helpful to know we have a, a good variety of folks, um, some who may be looking to do production versus more of a homesteading situation and folks who might not be sure yet. So um, we're going to talk all the basics of beginner sheep and goat, and then we can dive into some of those more detailed questions. Um, so I'm Catherine Brignac. I'm the Livestock and Natural Resources Educator here in Ulster County, which is in the Hudson Valley Kingston office, um, for those who aren't familiar. Um, so I work with all types of livestock farmers, so I'm kind of a generalist position. Um, and then I also do the Natural Resources and Climate Smart Farming programming here um, within our agriculture department. Um, so we, as Ruby was saying, um, we have a lot of different areas of work in our office, um, but we have a few different specialties, you know, field crops. And then um, I work, again, mostly with livestock and helping people product, um, protect their natural resources. So that's my focus for education for farmers in the community. Um, so I'm hoping to really go over a lot of what I see coming up frequently with uh, newer farmers that are just getting into sheep and goats. Um, a lot of the health stuff that I get calls about frequently um, and some of that nutrition, you know, is a big topic. I saw a lot of comments in there. So so we'll go through all of that. Um, it is a lot of information to cover in 45 minutes. So it might feel like I'm really breezing through some things. Just know the slides will go out afterwards and the recording so you can look more closely at anything that it seems like I glossed over. Um, I am just going to turn off my video so that I don't have any internet connectivity issues, hopefully, while we do this. Um, so we already did who's joining us. Um, so yeah, like to start out um, for anybody who may not yet have their farm, just kind of basic reg regulations to know about. Um, this is something we get a lot of calls on. Um, so always want, want to recommend first thing, you know, if you're thinking about bringing livestock onto your, your property to 
you know, talk with your neighbors, get an idea what concerns they're going to have, um, especially if they're really close to you, um, you know, so that you know how you can kind of design your farm to hopefully um, meet those concerns and not not have issues as you're going along. Um, so that's really a good starting place before you do anything else. Um, but your municipality is going to be who you want to start with to find out, you know, are you allowed to even have sheep and goats? How many you might be able to have? Any of those regulations about how far you need to keep animals from a property line, anything like that. Um, and then you can get into some of the state things like um, if you are in a more rural area, you may be able to qualify for an agricultural district and that can help get around um, some of the stricter municipality rules that you might have. Um, so if your town is to pass an ordinance, like a noise ordinance, um, being in an agricultural district can uh, support you. That that may not apply to you as a farmer. Um, so that's something to, to be aware of and um, start talking with your county zoning um, after you've dealt with your town or your city zoning um, to find out, you know, which animals you can have in the first place. And then th there's things like, you know, the ag tax exemption that does have, you know, certain qualifiers about the amount of land and the amount of money you need to be um, generating to qualify for that. Um, if you're doing, you know, dairy or planning to sell products, you may need permits from ag and markets. Um, and then of course you may consider insurance for risk management. So some of the great resources Cornell has around that. We have a guide to farming in New York that's really state specific. So that's something um, if you're not started yet that you're gonna wanna go through as you're doing your planning process. Um, if you are in the Catskills region, um, they do have a Catskills guide to farming and a beginning farmer mentor program. So um, those are available to anyone in the, the mid Hudson Catskills region. So. Um, but that also just has a lot of good resources in it, generally speaking. So those will be linked at the end. Um, okay. But starting out, if you're still trying to decide, you know, do I want sheep or goats or maybe both? Um, some of the similarities, they're both ruminants. So very similar nutrition, uh, very similar life cycle. They're, they're both herd animals. So they really like the social aspect, um, you know, in nature, they were prey animals. So they like that safety and security of being in a herd together um, where they have some behavior differences. Sheep are definitely, you know, more to staying with the flock. Um, that makes them easier to contain in a fence generally. And um, they're bigger on grazing grasses and forages. Whereas goats are, are known for being, you know, more independent, more curious, harder to contain it with a fence, um, you know, more prone to escape for sure. And they, really prefer a lot of the woody browse. Um, so if you've heard like goats eating poison ivy, um, their their nutritional plane is a little higher. So they they liked some of those um, browse more. Um, for, for management things to consider, you know, sheep are often, unless you're doing hair sheep, gonna need to be shorn at least once a year. Um, you, you wanna consider whether you want animals with horns or that have been pulled you know, because that can have its own challenges. And then, um, you know, some goat breeds are definitely less hardy, less um, adapted to our super cold climate. Um, so, you know, sheep have that thick wool. Um, a lot of goats can do just fine, um, but they may be not as excited to be out in the snow as, as sheep are going to be. Um, and then, of course, depending where you're located, what your market is, there may be a much stronger market for, you know, lamb versus goat or or goat milk, for example. So considering all of that. Um, some of, you know, the goat breeds that we see um, doing really well here, we put them basically into the three categories of meat, dairy, or fiber. Um, so this is a boar goat under meat. Um, so those are gonna be, you know, larger bodied animals with more muscling um, versus your dairy animals tend to be a little on the smaller side. Um, this is a Nigerian, dwarf, so it's, you know, very small, um, but those have been uh, bred to really pr produce, you know, much higher quality uh, quantities and lactate for much longer than our meat breeds. Um, so, you know, any meat breed is also going to produce some milk, um, but not in the same quantity as, you know, a Nubian or a Sanin. So um, that's the major differences there. So, you know, of course they can be dual purpose, um, but th there are some that are definitely better for certain purposes. And then you get into your fiber, which for goats, you had um, angora goats, which produce mohair. Um, and there's a few hybrid 
um, pygmy, pygmy angora or pygora and Nigerian angora, which is not agora. Um, so those differ slightly from um, the just pure angora. And then your cashmere is actually the undercoat. So um, there are some breeds that are specifically cashmere goats, um, but there's also um, a lot of your other breeds that produce cashmere. So just depends, um, you know, if you're really looking to just do fiber, then you probably want one of those pure breeds that's gonna produce the most fiber for you. Um, then moving into sheep, similar breakdown. Um, we have our, our meat sheep and katahdins and dorpers are really common in this part of the country. Um, that's a katahdin on the top. Um, so several of the meat breeds are also hair sheep, which means you do not have to shear them. Um, they'll, as you can see in this picture, um, they'll they'll shed on their own. Um, and hair sheep are also known for being more resistant to parasites, which is a really good thing um, in our part of the country where we have a lot of parasite issues. Um, but there's you know lots of variety within the meat breeds. Um, again, they're going to be have more muscling, a little larger bodied breeds. Um, but you can have something like this black Welsh Mountain on the bottom is known for their mutton and um, their black wool. So if that's something, you know, that's part of your goals, um, there's lots of different types of meat breeds in there. Um, and then as far as dairy sheep go, we mostly see East Frisian and Lacan here in the Northeast, um, but the Awasi is a newer breed that's been introduced from um, the Middle East not not too many years ago that's gaining popularity. Um, so those are all gonna produce a lot more milk for you than your meat breeds. Um, and generally you're gonna see, notice that the dairy breeds are gonna be less likely to have um, horns. And that's because you, know, you want animals that are easier to handle um, frequently, um, that have a better temperament and that you, know, you don't have to worry about um, the horns getting in the way, so. That's true for, for sheep and goats. Um, and then for fiber, you know, every every sheep that's not a hair sheep is gonna produce wool, but the finer wool, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. You know, everyone's probably heard of Merino. Um, there's also Cormo, Rambouillet, Romneys are more of a fine medium, um, but there's several breeds that are known for producing these really nice um, coats that are give, gonna give you more fiber, more of that fine fiber that folks are looking for. Um, so just general startup cost, and this is very, very variable, but um, adult animals starting around $200 to $500 is most of what I've been seeing um, listed around here, although I've seen up to, you know, $800 or even $1,000, depending on the animal, um, whereas your lambs and kids are going to be somewhere between like $50, you know, up above $400, depending, and that's, you know, somewhat based on where you're located, the age of the animal, um, the health status, if they can, you know, say for sure that it's clear of certain health issues, um, if it's a proven breeder, and then if it's important for you to have something that's registered or with certain genetics, that's that's going to be a higher price point generally. Um, so kind of getting into the markets um, to help decide what you might want to, which direction you might want to go. Um, the timing to get to market weight for, for lambs and goats is about the same, um, five, five-ish months, depending, you know, on what size animals you, you want in the end. But uh, the lambs are going to be bigger. You're looking at 90 to 120 pounds usually for market weight, whereas your goats more like 50 to 90 pounds. Um, and then, it, you know, there is also the option to sell um, sheep as mutton, which just means that they're over a year of age. Um, mutton's not as popular at least yet in the United States as some other parts of the world. Um, but there are some people who who really like it and seek that out. Um, so as far as marketing, there's really no single best option. Um, it is a smaller market compared to beef or pork, but it is growing here in New York. Um, so, you know, direct to consumer sales like a farm stand um, on your farm, farmers markets, selling direct to restaurants are options. Um, we have a platform called Meat Suite where farmers can sell direct to customers um, by the whole animal or half animal. Um, so things like the freezer trade a lot or CSAs allow um, a lot of different direct to consumer options to get creative with. Um, or there's also auctions, um, especially like ethnic markets and around ethnic holidays is a big um, market for 
for lambs and goats. So knowing what those are and just considering like it may, it's going to affect your breeding decisions a lot about, you know, breeding at the right time to have that right sized animal um, on the dates of those holidays, which can change year to year for a lot of them. So uh, we do have some good tools to help with that through Cornell that are linked further down. Um, another tool we have is this New York Livestock Processor map. Um, so finding a processor is very challenging in the Hudson Valley. It may, may not be as difficult in other parts of the state. I know we have folks from all over, um, but people are booking very far in advance, six months to a year um, and potentially traveling out of the state or, or several hours away. Um, so there's, there's a real bottleneck with processing um, and it depends partially on what kind of processor you're looking for. Um, so USDA is going to give you the most um, options for how you can sell your product, but um, there's also custom exempt, uh, which would be like the freezer trade option. Um, there's, you know, on-farm slaughter. And then if you um, are interested in opening a 20C processing facility, just know that your animals do have to go through the USD slaughterhouse, USDA slaughterhouse first before you can do any on-farm, um, you know, cutting them into smaller um, pieces and packing to sell. Um, so this map um, can help you, you know, locate who might be um, closest to you that, that you can reach out to and then see if it fits your needs. And then just last thing about the meat market, you know, understanding what the most valuable cuts are. Um, every butcher is going to have a different cut sheet. So, so you'll want to make sure you're on the same page with them um, about what you want. And, you know, it's really going to depend on your market preferences. Like, are you selling somewhere that wants, you know, large expensive cuts of meat or is your, you know, you know your farm stand, maybe people who just want to spend a smaller amount and pick something up for, for dinner that night. Um, so kind of thinking through all that in advance, um, make sure you're ready to to get that information to your your processor. Um, but yeah, generally speaking for, for both um, sheep and goat, you know, the rack of ribs, the shoulder, loin, legs, shanks are, are going to be your higher value cuts. Um, whereas, you know, neck is not as as popular um, and the innards are awful. You know, there, there may be certain customers looking for it, but um, you'll have to think about what you're going to do with those as well. Um, Catherine, do you want to explain the freezer trade a little bit more? Yeah, so freezer trade would be um, selling like a half an animal or a quarter of an animal in advance. Um, so um, you need that set up before you go to the processor. Basically, that that animal belongs to someone else. And then um, that custom exempt processor can, can cut cut that up um, and give it directly to them. So it's it's not for resale, basically. So it, it's going, you know, in somebody's freezer is the idea behind that. Um, so that's, you know, if you can't get into a USDA processor, which has happened to a lot of people, especially during COVID, then that's an option to to get around that. Um, but you can't, you can't, um, you can't decide to sell it you know, to people afterwards, it, it has to be all arranged in advance, kind of like a, a CSA idea. If that clarifies um, anything else on that. Um, and then live animal sales would be um, so the person wants to do the, the slaughter themselves on your, your farm. Um, so basically you're selling them the animal and then they can um, slaughter and process it themselves. Okay, sounds like that answered the question. Um, can you purge and move them to your local farm? Um, I might have to go to get to the other one um, at the end because I'm not sure I, I quite understand the other question that's here. Um, okay, so moving just quickly into dairy. Um, one important thing to understand with dairy, uh, of course, if you're just looking to milk for your own homestead, um, there's no regulations around what you can do with the milk for yourself, um, you know, just have your your bucket and and your you know your fridge ready but if you're thinking of selling um, or doing processed foods like cheese and yogurt the ag and markets um, permitting process is you know pretty pretty stringent um, so you'll need a building that's inspected you'll need um, permits based on what you're doing um, if you're doing raw milk that's a lot more testing that's required um, so getting familiar with with that um, before you invest is um, my recommendation there. And also 
kind of thinking about who your customer base is before you invest in um, some of these more expensive equipment, like a milking parlor you see here, um, you know, the pasteurizers, the cheese kettles, all that stuff is, is definitely a large investment for going into the dairy industry. Um, just generally speaking, you can expect your animals will lactate, you know, for a dairy breed up to eight to 10 months after they give birth. Um, and on average, you, you can think you'll get about one to four quarts of milk a day, but that's going to vary, you know, from very small amounts to potentially, you know, a few gallons on other days. So, so that's really an average over the course of those entire eight to 10 months. Um, it averages out to about, you know, one quart to one gallon a day, um, but going to vary a lot by breed. And then the fiber market. Um, you know, there's a lot of different routes you can go depending on your goals. Um, so you can just plan to shear and bag it up and sell to someone like that. Um, if you're looking at doing more processing into to wool, then you're going to be um, doing the carding, the scoring, the spinning with the wheel all yourself. Um, so that's a, a little bit more of an investment. Um, two things really important with wool quality, the nutrition has to be really high. Um, and you know, avoiding contamination with plant material are, are the biggest things that are going to impact the quality of wool. Um, so there's a number of characteristics that um, play into, you know, what that wool might be used for. Um, but fiber diameter is kind of the biggest one. So those finer wool breeds um, like merinos are going to give you that soft wool for things that you're going to, you know, have next to the skin. So for that really soft wool clothing. Um, your medium wool, which you would get from a lot of your meat breeds, is going to be better for other clothes. It's going to be, you know, more like maybe gloves, hats, um, things like that. And then longer or coarser wool is that kind of itchy wool that you think of for, for a wool coat or a rug. Um, so you can see on this picture here is showing, you know, finer on the left to, to coarser on the right. Um, but wool grading is really its own huge topic. Um, this is a, this Police and Fiber source book is a, a good resource, um, but we have a lot of stuff online to really dive into that. Um, as far as markets for fiber, there's, you know, bulk buying wool pools, they're called here in New York. Um, you can also do direct sales to commercial buyers, um, or you can do the sorting and really, you know, sell it online, sell it at festivals, farm tours, um, make products out of it and sell that either wholesale or direct to consumer um, or go you know, all the way to making finished products to sell. Um, so it's just going to, the equipment is going to depend on um, what your goals are for that. Um, other markets I just wanted to touch on, you know, agritourism is a really popular thing now with, you know, farm tours, events, goat yoga, et cetera. Um, you know, cosmetics is a good workaround. A lot of people are using for their milk if they don't want to go through the regulation of selling milk as a food item, you know, making it into soap or lotion. Um, if you want to do prepared foods, we have our Cornell Food Venture Center um, that can provide guidance and help with um, those recipes and um, permitting around that. Um, you know, other value-added products, um, you know, felting, yarn, um, a lot, a lot of interest in recent years in grazing. So either, you know, renting goats for weed control, things like poison ivy um, or other invasives or renting sheep out to, to graze solar farms, um, you know, breeding just to sell breed stock or um, raising animals to, to do shows could be another source of income. Um, and no, you, you, I see the comment here, you don't need permits to use goat milk for soap or lotion um, since it's a cosmetic product. So pause here. I, this was really just for me to see if there were questions I needed to answer, but um, if anybody wants to share, you know, if that, that gave them any clarity around whether they're more excited about cheaper goats, um, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, but I'm just going to keep going for now. Um, so yeah, once you've decided what kind of animals you want to get, um, how do you find a good quality breeder with healthy animals? Um, so biosecurity is a huge concern for sheep and goats. Um, so anytime you have a closed herd where animals, you know, are all coming in at the same time, all going out at the same time, it's going to be, you know, safer 
than an open herd where new animals are getting introduced all the time. So um, that's one thing you can look for. Um, and generally speaking, the least risky option is gonna be a commercial breeder, commercial farm with a good reputation. Um, so, you know, as you get into like your auctions, your, um, you know, sale barns, you have to kind of wonder why, why are people getting rid of these animals? A lot of times it's because there is something going on with that animal um, and you're not going to know everything about um, the genetics and all of those um, other health related questions that you're going to be able to find from, from somebody whose um, whole business is, is breeding animals. So um, you you should expect that a breeder would be willing to discuss, you know, what health testing they've had, be able to tell you what their herd is clean of. That's kind of the, the phrase you'll hear. So uh, a clean herd, you know, free of scrapey, for example. Um, definitely a bit of a red flag if, if you're not getting those kinds of answers um, or if they don't want to, you know, have you to see their facility. Um, so those are kind of the best advice I can give around that. Um, one thing to, to be aware of is parasites are a big issue. So knowing the history, the warming status, um, can they um, tell you for sure that they don't have resistant worms that you're bringing on your farm? Um, those are all important things to ask about. Um, and if you are buying animals, moving animals across state lines, be aware that you may need a certificate of veterinary inspection um, and the federal government does um, require scrapey ID for, for goats and sheep in some cases that are being moved um, from state to state. Um, so you can find more about that through USDA APHIS, um, which also has just a lot of great information about biosecurity and other diseases. Um, but again, I always recommend that you should lay eyes on an animal and get a chance to evaluate them before you bring them home and um, onto your farm. So first thing we recommend is kind of the five point check, which is part of um, FOMACHA scoring, which I'll, I'll explain more later, but looking, um, you know, does their nose have any signs of discharge? Do their eyes look healthy? Um, any signs of anemia? Any swelling around the jaw? That can be a sign of a bad parasite infection. Um, do they seem like they have enough fat and muscle covering on the back? So feeling along the spine um, and then looking for, you know, around the tail, do they have signs of, you know, diarrhea or some other digestive issue that may indicate a bad parasite infection or any other red flags. Um, so other than that, um, you know, looking, just observing their their legs, um, their coat look nice and healthy and shiny. Um, do their udders and reproductive organs look normal and healthy? Um, are they behaving like you would expect a, a healthy animal to to behave, you know, eating, socializing, um, walking normally, not seeming to have any issues putting weight on their hooves. Um, so all of that you would want to check out um, as bare minimum. And then, you know, you may, you may want to ask more questions about if you're getting into breeding, you know, what kind of mother is this animal? Um, you know, how old are they? What's the reason they're selling it? Um, you know, if genetics or registration are important, you know, make sure there's paperwork around that. Um, and then, you know, there are different animals. Some are going to be bred more specifically for show versus commercial production. So if efficiency of production is really important, you want to make sure you're, you're finding um, those animals and not an animal that's, that's really just a show animal. Um, and then whether um, those animals have been on pasture versus in a confinement setting is going to determine how they do, you know, in your production as well. So if, if an animal's never been out on pasture, they're not going to um, be able to utilize that as well as an animal that um, is already adjusted to that. So important things to, to ask about. Um, okay. So wanted to just touch on, you know, labor is one of the biggest costs with raising animals. Um, and so I get a lot of questions like, how much time does this really take to, to move animals around um, if you're doing a grazing system? And short answer is it really depends on, on how you decide to manage your farm. Um, but the daily things you know you'll need to do, check your fences, make sure all the animals are in there, <laughs> you know, check the water and feed and spend some time observing them every day. And that's, um, you know, going to help you catch anything that is going on early. Um, and then you've got, you know, your more frequent and seasonal things to plan for. 
Um, so you may be moving paddocks and temporary fencing really frequently, um, or you may not, um, you know, cleaning out beds and um, pens, of course, uh, trimming hooves is something that has to get done for these animals, um, vaccinating and drenching, probably something that you're going to need to do at least a few times a season, um, unless you choose not to do that. Um, and then, you know, your pasture man management and maintenance and shearing for, for wool sheep or other fiber animals. And then hopefully less frequently, but, you know, always just know escapees, sick, injured animals, you know, be prepared for, for what you're going to have to do in those situations um, in advance. Um, so biggest thing everybody's going to need, you know, we live in New York, we get cold winters. Um, so that wind chill plus rain and snow is too much um, for animals to not have some kind of shelter. So um, even if you're doing one of these kind of movable shelters, like we see um, at the very top and in the left corner here, um, you need something that's going to help block that wind and um, moisture from coming in. So um, at least two signs, ideally three, is the recommendation. Um, a lot of people like to repurpose some of these sheds or things like greenhouses. You can see um, this bottom corner is somebody who's doing completely um, confinement based in a high tunnel. So it got you know quite a number of animals in there just in, in different pens. Um, so lots of options for what you can do here. You know, you see people using kind of like the igloo doghouse setting, you know, setup. So um, as long as it provides, you know, shelter from the wind and rain, it can work. Um, so if you're you're only dealing with a few animals, you, you know, these sheds can be a really great option. Um, but if you are planning to do lambing or kidding, you are going to want somewhere that you can get some electricity for some heat too for those babies. So, so keep that in mind. Um, general space requirement, we say 15 to 20 square feet per animal in any shelter. Um, and you want to make sure that they can all eat at the same time. So one and a half to two feet of feeder space per animal. Um, and then as far as outdoor area, we say one animal unit or AU, which is a thousand pounds of animal per acre is, is the um, guideline for any livestock. So usually that's like five or six sheep, if you consider they're going to have, you know, if you are breeding. Um, but it just depends on the size of them as well. So that's the basic guidelines on that. And then the next biggest thing you need is a good fence, especially if you have goats. So um, we recommend at least 40 to 48 inches high um, for a perimeter or more permanent fence. Um, woven wire and high tensile are the two most popular options that you see, um, but you can also utilize you know, cattle or hog panel with T-post or um, you know, a, a completely wooden fence is going to be more expensive, but totally a good option as well if you want something really um, permanent. And then if you're doing subdivided paddocks or um, some kind of temporary fencing, the two most popular options are this electric netting or poly wire um, that are both electrified um, and really easy to move around, lightweight options. So um, the netting does... Um, you know, somewhat better job of keeping animals in as well as predators um, out since the openings are smaller. Um, you know, I definitely know people who have had um, animals squeeze between the, the poly wire. So just like to mention that um, it works well for other people though. So um, both good options. Um, biggest thing to understand with electric fencing is you do have to train your animals to electric fence. You don't just um, throw them in there and expect them to stay in. Um, so that that will take some time and um, work on your part. But um, once once they learn, for the most part, um, they will respect the fence. So um, other thing to consider, especially with goats, um, if they can stick their head through, <laughs> they will get their horns stuck. Um, so you want the openings to be small enough that ideally they can't do that. Um, and you don't, if you're doing the temporary fencing, you want to be careful not to leave any obvious gaps under um, or anything that they can use to jump over. Because um, once one animal figures out how to escape, they do, you know, follow the leader is kind of the, the rule of thumb. So, um, and they don't forget once they've figured it out. 
So, so those are the biggest things with fence. Um, but you know, electric fencing does does take frequent checks. Um, you know, make sure your energizers working properly. Make sure everything's properly grounded. Um, check the charge. See, make in case something's draining it. So you can see kind of what those different pieces look like in this picture on the bottom. Um, yeah, and you know, you want to do that both to make sure your animals can't just run through it, and also um, to keep those predators out. Um, so high enough charge to to repel things like coyotes if that's an issue where you are, um, but may not be an issue for for folks everywhere. Um, so unless you have other, you know, guardian animals, then predators are definitely um, an issue that you want to exclude through your fencing. Any comments, Ruby, that are like burning questions right now? I should, while I'm pausing. How do you train to the electric fence? Um, you know, different people do it different ways. Um, there's no single right way. Um, a lot of people will you know, put the animals in a halter or a collar and put food on the other side of the fence so that they they go for the food, feel the shock, um, and then you can hold them so that they don't just run through the fence. Um, so doing that enough times until they, they get familiar with it, basically, you know, some version of that, um, you know, and similar to, to halter breaking them, you know, they're not they're not going to get it right away and they're probably going to throw a little bit of a fit, but, um, you know, just consistently until you, until they adjust and, and realize what's going on. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's different methods if you, you know, lots of YouTube videos about this. Um, but th that's usually what I've seen folks do. And then I think you mentioned drenching in terms of deworming, I presume. Yes. I mean, it could also, um, drench is kind of a, a general term. So usually it's um, deworming um, just through a, like a syringe into the mouth. It could also be a way to give, you know, vitamins or other supplements. Yeah. And then Brooke is right. Just in terms of sheep and goats together, they have different needs. So something to be mindful of. Yes. Correct. But they can coexist. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely people who have um, both together. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to move into a few of the kind of handling and health basics here. Um, so one thing to, to understand um, handling wise, uh, all these animals have a, what we call a flight zone. So when you enter into their flight zone, that's a way they're going to start moving away from you. So that's how you can basically um, direct them. By, by entering that circle of their flight zone, um, either to the left or right. Um, but they do not see very well directly in front or behind them. Um, so they're going to try to turn all the way around um, if, you, if you get out of their range of vision. So just important ways to, to think about moving the herd together. Um, and then, you know, you can use these halters or, or collars are more common for goats um, or some people just grab under the chin and kind of uh, move them that way. So harder than it looks, I will say that, um, to, you know, it takes some practice at first to, to get good at wrangling um, these animals. Um, uh, but halter breaking them is definitely an option. Um, and especially if you're doing, you know, show animals, you'll, you'll need to, to work on that. Um, for sheep specifically, uh, this rump sit position, is the way you're going to want to do a lot of your um, health management. So uh, you can tip them by pressing down on the rump and turning their head all the way back um, and then leaning them back onto your legs like this. Um, so that's something to get familiar with. Um, you can also use, you know, stanchions, shoots, especially for larger numbers of animals, um, or these tilt tables, which is what's in the middle here, where you direct them in there and they get um, you know, you close the door and then you can tip them on their side to do things like trimming hooves. So those can make your life a lot easier and, and definitely save your back. Um, so worth the investment if you're you're dealing with a lot of animals. Um, as far as health and nutrition go, um, the, the only vaccine that's universally recommended is what we call CDT. Um, so it protects against three types of clostridium bacteria that are very common. Um, they're already present in the sheep. So if you've heard of overeating disease or enterotoxemia, um, it's much easier to prevent by vaccinating than it is to treat once um, they're showing symptoms. So 
oftentimes by the time you realize your animal is sick, they're going to be um, dead within a few hours and there, there's not a lot the vets can do. So that is why that's um, kind of universally recommended for both lambs and um, kids as well as the adult animals. Um, and that's something you'll give usually in the armpit or this area of the neck is where we give vaccines for, for sheep and goats um, to avoid those higher cut areas of meat. Um, and you can just go right underneath the skin for those. Um, there are a number of other vaccines you can consider with your vet, um, but a lot of these diseases can be prevented by just practicing good biosecurity and not bringing sick animals onto your farm. So not necessarily something everybody will need. Um, other thing being parasites. So barber pole worm is the biggest concern. Um, we have this FAMACHA system to check the eyelid by pulling it down to see how anemic the animal is. So if you um, see, you know, a pretty red eyelid when you pull it down, they're probably doing okay and don't need to be dewormed. Whereas if you pull that down and it's, you know, totally white, then you have an animal that's um, got a very bad infection um, of these nematodes. And that's when you would want to deworm. Um, so this wormx.info is kind of the, um, the place that puts together a lot of different information about dewormers, um, selective treatment, and then all of these other practices you can utilize like grazing or, you know, selecting certain breeds and genetics uh, to reduce your levels of parasites and avoid getting um, resistant worms. Um, so deer worm, on the other hand, is, is not something you can identify through FAMACHA testing. Um, it's going to cause more neurological symptoms. So it actually migrates into the spinal cord or, you know, potentially the brain. Um, and so you'll see things like staggering, um, you know, animals that can't stand. Um, so that's one that gets into pastures um, through deer who pass it to slugs. So another very common one here. And then coccidia is the other main thing we see, which is a protozoa. And that usually shows up as um, just diarrhea, scours, and, um, and younger animals particularly. Um, and you can treat that through uh, medicated feed. Um, so there's a number of other things, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but just want to say, you know, there's a few um, really big contagious diseases to be aware of. Um, and always take precautions. If you do see an animal that seems sick, a lot of these things are zoonotic, so they can be passed from these animals to humans. Um, so I just like to make sure I mention, you know, wearing gloves, using your PPE is always um, best practice if you notice that an animal's sick um, and having a plan to quarantine them so it doesn't spread. Um, but there's also a number of things we see a lot related to feed. So um, making sure you're storing feed properly can prevent a lot of this and not changing their diets too quickly. Um, you know, like switching animals onto grain quickly can cause a lot of issues or, um, you know, a really rich, lush pasture um, without, without any um, chance to adjust to that is um, often what causes some of these other issues. Um, and then getting your forage tested, which we'll, we'll talk about to make sure you don't have any of these deficiency issues. And then there's other things to be aware of just related to hygiene. Um, so mastitis of the udders or um, issues with hooves are common. Um, so I mentioned earlier, hoof trimming is really important. Um, just want to shout out um, this video from Cornell Cooperative Extension Southwest New York um, listed in the resources can show you, you know, how to how this process works. Um, but basically, if you're starting with something that looks like the left, um, you want it to, to look like this image on the right when you're done. So nice and flat. Um, the toes and the edges tend to get overgrown. Um, so that's where you're going to focus your trimming on. And that's to, to prevent these bacterial issues that can eventually cause lameness. Um, so these, you know, this is what you're looking out for, for foot rot and foot scald. Um, and they can be caused by contagious things or also environmental issues. So, um, yeah, just practicing good hygiene with that regular trimming um, can help prevent a lot of issues with hooves. Um, and then just quickly, you know, we do recommend that everybody has a standing relationship with the vet if they're raising goats and sheep. Um, not just for emergencies, but also because a lot of medications are going to be off-label, especially for goats, meaning you're going to be using it in a way that's different than what's on the label. And legally, to do that, um, it is required that you have the advisement of a vet. 
Um, so most antibiotics just um, became more regulated, so you can no longer get them uh, from, you, you know, a feed supply store. You will need to be working with your vet on that. So something to be aware of um, to try. We do have, you know, a shortage of large animal vets. So trying to find somebody who's willing to work with you um, and come out to your farm um, early on is important. Um, and they can help you with your herd health plan. Um, and also understand withdrawal periods, especially if you're planning on um, sending your animals to slaughter or selling them the milk. That's that's really important to make sure we keep uh, pharmaceuticals out of the food chain. Um, and so didn't hear a lot of questions about reproduction, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this. Um, but just um, your animals will become sexually mature anywhere from as early as four months to eight months or about 60 percent of their adult weight. Um, most of the time you're going to expect they're going to birth twins or triplets, but it could be, you know, one to four is, you know, what you're generally going to be expecting for babies. Um, and if you're trying to breed, you want at least one ram or buck per, you know, people say 35 to 50, depending um, on the animal user does, um, can get bred from one ram or buck. Um, so naturally these animals breed once a year, mostly in the fall. Um, so if you do want to have a uh, year round supply of lambs or, or milk, then you're probably going to be inducing breeding through some other method. Um, so you'll want to decide, you know, what the best time for you is to do that breeding. Um, and then you can, can decide whether you want to use, you know, a ram or buck effect, which is basically taking that animal out and then reintroducing them to stimulate heat, or if you want to use um, some of the hormonal options like these implants you can see here, um, or other, you know, methods with changing light um, that can stimulate um, or help synchronize breeding so that you're lambing all at the same time. Um, there's also, you know, AI for, you know, surgical or non-surgical ways if you, um, have a reason that you don't want to be introducing a buck onto your um, your farm. So um, the pregnancy lasts about five months for both species. Um, so about 150 days, they say to plan for. Um, there are ways to confirm through ultrasound or blood tests, and then you'll see a lot of you know physical signs much later on towards the very end. Um, you'll start to see changes in the vulva and the udders. Um, Right before um, they give birth, they'll kind of move away and start nesting, um, stop eating. And then within um, the time you see this water bag, it's kind of like we say with humans, you know, the water breaks, that's, you know, you'll see this bag come out. And within about an hour of that, you should expect to start seeing um, some progress in, in the birthing. So um, common question when to help out. Um, if you If you don't, continue to see things progress within, you know, half an hour or so after you first see um, signs that she's giving birth, um, then you may need to consider that um, the lamb or the kid could be breech, um, which means that they're uh, facing the wrong way or they could have their head positioned wrong or their, their legs positioned wrong. So lots of options which get more and more complicated with twins or triplets um, to be aware of. Um, so you may need to intervene and gently reposition that that animal. Um, just other things with pregnant animals to watch out for, pregnancy toxemia. If you see an animal that suddenly is late in pregnancy and stops eating or um, seems very lethargic, that would be something you may want to call your vet. Um, could be something to do with the nutrition. And then anytime you see an animal have an abortion or a birth defect, you want to try to diagnose what's causing that because it, it could be disease or it could be nutrition related. Um, lots of things can cause those. Uh, biggest things for to, after. Catherine, Sorry? just flagging the time just to make sure that we get through the, all the, okay. the rest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so quickly, you know, Biggest thing after lambing or kidding, keep them really dry and warm. You'll want a separate area that they can be in, and then you'll want to have all your supplies around to to make sure you're ready to bottle feed and and do all those tasks with you know trimming um, umbilical cord, tail docking, castration, anything else. Um, all right. So last little section here would be nutrition. Um, so forages are biggest thing for all of our our ruminants being herbivores. Um, General rule of thumb is they need about two to four percent of their body weight. 
Um, and since they had these four stomachs, um, the rumen is going to really efficiently extract that. And that's why they can survive just on, you know, grass and hay, um, unlike some of our monogastric animals. So um, a high quality hay or like an alfalfa or a grain is often going to be used if you're doing breeding or lactation um, just to, to get that nutritional plane up further. Um, one other thing to mention here that the rumen isn't developed right away. Um, so it takes about eight weeks before a lamb or a kid can survive completely on, on hay. So you're going to need, you know, milk or milk replacer if you have an orphan, um, for the, at least those eight weeks. Um, other things, you know, always having a supply of fresh, clean water. You can estimate about two to three gallons per animal per day. And then, um, minerals are a big supplement that's needed for these animals. Um, so some kind of free choice or block mineral, um, and just make sure that you're checking labels because sheep are much more sensitive to copper. It's very toxic for them at, um, at the levels that you might find in a goat mineral. Um, so other vitamin deficiencies that are common because of our soil in New York would be selenium and vitamin E. Um, so those may be things you need to supplement as well. Um, briefly, if you're planting a pasture, you're going to mostly plant cool season grasses like orchard grass. Timothy, some of these um, that are listed here for New York, um, those are going to do best um, for the longest period of time in our climate. Um, and then you can add different legumes for protein um, and to help fix nitrogen in your soil. So alfalfa, clovers, bird's, bird's foot trefoil are all popular ones for goats and sheep. Um, you can add other annuals, you know, for those kind of summer slumps where we get really high temperatures where our cool, glass, cool grasses do not do as well. Um, and then, especially for goats, you know, having some of that woody forage or fodder available. Um, they love things like multiflora rose, um, willows, different vines and shrubs. They'll eat the bark and the leaves off of that. Um, so that's something that they they really enjoy and that they can get a lot of nutrition out of. Um, so there's even whole silvopasture systems where you can plant different trees and shrubs. And then we have a lot of good resources on that through Cornell. Um, but if you're Planning on going through, you know, breeding process, um, you'll want to look into the how the nutritional needs change um, throughout the life cycle. Um, something like this from the National Research Council can help you determine how you'll need to adjust the crude protein and other um, energy levels. Um, and then we have a number of tools here. I'll just quickly go through forages.org can help you select um, best forages for your situation. Um, you can do forage testing to determine, you know, the nutritive value and how palatable or how much um, they want to eat it, how much they can intake and digest. Um, and that's going to mostly look at these different types of fiber and protein. Um, and so these are some general guidelines for what you want to see for that. Um, but the biggest things that are going to affect your nutrition, um, other than the species and variety, are going to be your soil fertility. So you're going to want to make sure you're doing regular soil testing and adjusting for that. And then the age um, maturity stage of the plants at grazing or when the hay is, is cut. So um, you want to do it before it gets very stemmy. These animals really like those softer, um, less mature grasses and forages. Um, so earlier on is is ideal and that's gonna be more palatable for them. Um, so this is a tool that can help you learn more about your soil online if you ha um, haven't had soil testing done yet and what's gonna grow well for you. And then this is an example of what a forage test looks like. So once you get this, if, um, if you need help interpreting it, that's where you can call your local extension agent and we can help walk through, you know, whether this is meeting the nutritional needs for your specific animals. Um, but you'll be looking here just quickly to point out the dry matter basis column on the right is what we reference because um, that's not being diluted by the waters in there. So that's going to tell you your actual usable protein amounts, um, you know, how much, how much of those fibers are digestible and usable. Um, and then your mineral contents are another big thing to, to check and make sure they're all um, all where they should be. Um, so there are some great programs, ration balancing softwares, where once you have that information, you plug that in. Um, you can plug in multiple different sources of hay or grain, and it can help you um, determine how much to feed 
to get the right re- ratios and nutrition um, based on where your animal's at in their life cycle, whether they're you know lactating or growing and all of that. Um, so this is, is one that's recommended, but we have a lot more um, resources online. It is you know fairly complicated. Some people work with a nutritionist for this, um, but it's definitely something you can do the math on yourself if you would like to. Um, and yeah, the biggest thing to understand with grazing management is rotational grazing um, or dividing your paddock into smaller sub paddocks is gonna be the best thing to improve your forage quality. Um, throughout the season and it's going to give your pasture plants more time to rest before they get grazed again um, make them more resilient and give more consistent nutrition Um, so grazing plants are something we and your local soil and water conservation district can help with um, if you want to start doing rotational grazing Um, and then also understanding what you have and what is a weed is going to be important for helping you improve So these are some good resources for that. Um, Yeah, this is, you know, resources that'll come out. So um, I know somebody asked, I think, about like finding bucks. So this Cornell uh, sheep and goat management list server is a really good resource um, to find other farmers who may may be selling animals um, to just ask your questions. Um, There's vets on there, you know, extension agents and other specialists. Um, Sheep and Goat both have their own sub pages um, through Cornell with tons of resources about specific topics. Um, so highly recommend checking that out. Um, the annual Sheep and Goat Symposium in Ithaca every year is a great way to get some hands-on learning experience um, on, on a number of different topics. And then if you have animal health questions, the Cornell um, Diagnostic Lab can help with things like necropsies as well as um, working with the state program to send a state vet out to help with your herd health plan. Um, So there's some other, you know, more informal things, you know, Google groups that we recommend um, to newer people getting started. Um, Your breed and industry associations can be really good resources. Um, If you're doing fiber, I would recommend checking out the New York Sheep and Wool Festival um, and their workshops. Um, And then these are just a lot more links on more specific topics, but Sorry, I know I ran ran over with the questions in there, but I'm happy to stay on um, for as long as, as we have more questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to throw the final poll into the chat just so if folks um, wanted to hop off exactly at one, they're more than welcome. But I think feel free to stay and ask questions. Um, we really encourage you to to make sure that you leave here knowing the things that you wanted to learn but I launched that poll um Catherine I know there are a few questions in the chat yes um trying to to go back to the beginning uh I think we let me see I think we did those um answered about drenching um tips and resources to halter train them I would look in, look around at 4-H resources and we could, you know, um, connect you with some of those, you know, people who are doing shows are probably um, most likely to be the ones halter training animals. Um, so I can, I can see what I can find when we send out the follow-up email for that. Um, for a CDT to a pregnant you. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember what the recommendation is for exactly when. I mean, I have to kind of say follow what's on the label and the advice of your vet for that because I, I'm not a veterinarian. Um, but I think we do have some good resources that I, I can link to for um, vac- vaccine suggestions for, for that as well um, from the vets at Cornell. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't remember what the timing recommendation is for that. Um, do you recommend... And then as far as routine deworming, um, so again, FAMACHA um, recommendation is to to use their scoring for anemia before you deworm. So do selective deworming of certain animals that are showing a need for it um, rather than just blanket deworming. And that's that's what the research has shown is uh, most effective and um, to prevent, again, that 
resistance in worms that we're seeing, which is becoming a real big problem for producers um, once once things are no longer working for them. Um, so the other thing you can do is fecal um, fecal egg counts can help determine um, what's working for you and which animals need to be dewormed. Um, but we, we don't recommend just blanket deworming all animals on a regular basis. Um, if, if coccidia is your main issue, that's more common with younger animals. Um, so you could do a medicated feed in that, that case if you're having a lot of issues with coccidia. Um, oh, thank you for the nice, sweet comments. A wealth of knowledge. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, did I miss any in there? I don't think so, but if okay. anybody wants to take themselves off mute, feel free. So it looks like Margaret has a one in the chat. Feeding for pygmy goats. Um, I mean, it's not, so pygmy goats, not necessarily feeding them differently based on their, their breed. It's, it's again, going to be, you know, if you're looking for a certain amount of hay you need to give them per day is that the question or I mean it's going to be based on their weight again it's like a percentage two to four percent of their weight for maintenance their life cycle you know if they're growing or where they're at with that um, there's not really anything that's specific to the breed it's more about what um, what nutritional needs they're they've got at that stage of their life and if you're trying to get them to put more weight on or just maintain um I don't, I don't know if there's a specific question about what you're feeding them right now that I can answer. Or... Yeah, it's it's Margaret. I, I what I'm a little confused. I have a bunch of them in a pen, and they're like they all eat when they eat, and some of them get a little overweight and bloated, and other mm -hmm. ones look like they're more you know standard size. I'm just confused about how do you if you have a group. Let's say there's like seven or eight of them. And a like a relatively, I don't know, large shed, and oh. yeah. So that's kind of where I'm going. And with the the grain too, like the, I believe they feed them grain like once a day. It's just I work on two farms. In one farm, I see the the four goats that are together. They're in very slim order. The other goats that are on this other farm, they seem kind of chubby. So I'm trying to figure out. That's where I'm at. <laughs> I mean, I would wonder if it could be a um, parasite issue because that, that will cause them to lose weight. Um, I don't know if they have if they check them regularly. No, the goats look very healthy and happy. It's just I see a different. They're, they're a good perfect size. It's the other farm where I see the chubby goats that I'm not really understanding what they're doing that's making them chubby. That's really what I'm trying to figure <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, um, if you have, you know, forage testing, I mean, that would be the place to start because it, it may be that what they're getting is much higher and you know, protein or energy. Um, it could be the difference in how much exercise they're getting, although it doesn't really sound like it. it sounds like they're they're both kind of um mostly indoors, but I think you'd have to get get everything they're getting fed um tested and and see what what might be going on there. It's probably the answer. Um but you know there there is a role of just genetics as well. Um you know, with it, with any, you know, feed utilization. So it's hard to say, you know, without knowing all the details of the, of the goats. Um, but those are some things that you could start with. I think we'll do one last question in the chat. Okay. How do you determine how much selenium or vitamin E to supplement? Um, so, yeah, if you're raising them completely on pasture, um, then you could look at your soil test results to see, you know, how your your levels are looking. Um, or again, forage testing for for hay that you're feeding. Um, but there's general recommendations if you look um, at the chart, like that I shared from uh, National Resource Council, that'll tell you about how much you're wanting to aim for. 
Um, so for those two, it, it's not as big of a concern as some of your other minerals, um, whether you go a little over, um, it's not as big of a deal as, you know, copper or, or overdoing the calcium. Um, so generally you're going to find standardized, you know, goat, goat or sheep vitamin mixes that you can add to your minerals for that. Um, but um, yeah, you'll just want to compare that to, to the charts for where your animals are at with their, their life cycle and make sure you're not um, giving them anything that's way off from that. So just checking labels. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining and thanks for filling out that poll. Um, I'm going to uh, sign off. Feel free to shoot either me or Catherine any questions that you have and I'll hopefully be sending out a video recording um, of this presentation tomorrow or early next week, um, as well as the presentation itself. So you can refer back to details and all those resources. So thank you everyone for joining. All right. Thanks so much, everyone.